Bonjour Aya. Bonjour Joris. Bonjour à tous. Uh, merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Today, Aya and I will introduce you to the religious movement of the Labadist and the hymns which we sang during our Huguenot Sunday service today. So we called our presentation the Sweet Singers of Israel. You will understand why very soon. The transatlantic poetic and musical journey of the Labadist movement. You'll know who are the Labadist in a minute too. If you didn't follow our Holy Communion service, in which we sang some of their hymns, you can find the video on our YouTube channel. On Huguenot Sunday, Saint-Esprit uh, remembers the legacy of French Protestant refugees who fled their country because of religious persecutions. We also pray uh, for all the persons who are persecuted today for their religious faith and practices throughout the world, and especially in France and in the US. The story Aya and I are going to lead you through is that of a 17th century dissenting Protestant movement and their poetic and musical creations. I came across the Labadist during my master's uh, at the Sorbonne with Professor Olivier Millet, and I researched their books scattered in libraries uh, throughout Europe and America. I was really interested uh, in their hymns, especially. Strangely enough, and it's quite a nice coincidence, um, the, it was years before I came to Saint-Esprit, and it's quite a providential coincidence uh, that my research also relates to the history of Saint-Esprit. Here you can see some crests from uh, some of the families of uh, founding families of Saint-Esprit, uh, de la Montagne, Bayard and Cresson, who were uh, members of the Labadist movement in America. There were others like de la Grange and um, Bouchel that were not on the crests in our church. So the period where the Labadist uh, developed or appeared, if you want, um, was a very special period in the history of Western Europe. Um, so you may wonder who are these uh, Labadists? Labadists uh, is, Labadism is a new Christian movement that emerged in the Walloon and Dutch Reformed churches in the Netherlands in the late 1660s. It is a time of great prosperity, as we probably know, uh, in the Netherlands. That's, this period of time is often referred to as the Dutch Golden Age. That's the period of Rembrandt, of tulips, and of all this uh, economic and cultural boom. It's a period of true embarras de richesse for the Netherlands. But this prosperity that you can see a little bit on this painting um, also caused reactions, a bit like today, um, when you have uh, great prosperity. And some people in Dutch society thought that the established church was being too outward and too worldly. And these people yearned for a more personal, a more communal, and transform transformative experience of the gospel. And the Labadist movement was gathering a lot of uh, these critiques, and um, although it was short-lived, it really catalyzed these critiques and profound, profoundly uh, influenced the religious life of the Protestant churches in Europe and especially in the Netherlands. So here you yeah, just have a, a quick a summary of how, who are the Labadists. They were a Protestant movement. They emerge from the Dutch and Walloon church. The Walloon church is the French speaking Reformed church in the Netherlands. They started really in 1669 and have couple of core beliefs and one of them is the fact that they're calling into their community elects and are really interested in the form of holistic change of life through piety, through goods which are held in common and they also have a millenarian expectation of the coming of Christ uh, that they consider and understand as a form of general restoration that's about to come. Their founder um, is, or one of their two founders, is Jean de Labadie. Um, de, de, de Labadie was a co-founder of the movement with another person we'll see in a moment, who is Anna Maria von Schurman. Uh, 
Labadi was a very strange bird in the religious landscape of the 17th century. He was a mystic, that is, he had very personal visions and encounters with uh, divine beings, and especially Christ, uh, but also the Virgin Mary. And he was a gifted preacher. Uh, he was a theologian and also a poet. Uh, his life challenged, as you can see on this list, uh, many of the denominational boundaries of the time, but also the cultural ones and the national ones that were uh, being affirmed and really established at that time. So he was born originally uh, in, near Bordeaux in France. He was born in a Roman Catholic uh, family and he became a priest, uh, he studied in a Jesuit school, but then he, he also converted to uh, the Reformed faith after a lot of troubles. And after his conversion, he served in Geneva, which was at the time the capital of uh, the Reformation and especially the Reform uh, faith. And after serving a couple of years in Geneva, he arrived in the Netherlands in 1667. The, the movement that Labadie formed uh, and started a bit later in uh, 1669 was called Labadism because some of the, his detractors associated, in him, associated the movement with his own uh, personal charisma. Um, he had indeed a very mystical call for the regeneration of the Church of God, which really left him uh, unsatisfied with what he, he saw uh, and experienced in contemporary established churches from both, both Catholic and Protestant. And a lot of his wandering through these denominations um, have to do with this deep yearning he had to restore the Church. Um, and, and really find, uh, find a new uh, restored form of piety and common life uh, um, in the spirit of the gospel. So when he arrived in the Netherlands in 1667 to serve as a pastor, his charismatic preaching and call for personal devotion uh, attracted many followers, and many of them were from noble birth and from the local elite um, and he uh, particularly uh, became friend with one of them, who is Anna Maria von Schurman. Anna Maria von Schurman is a really fascinating woman. She became Labadie's spiritual friend during all those years, and uh, since what they met in 167, uh, uh, 1667, um, they stayed together until the end of their life. She was a gifted artist. Uh, she was also a musician, uh, harpsichordist, <laughs> like Aya, and a poet um, and a defender of the education of women, which um, she published a couple of books and uh, had discussions with a lot of uh, European scholars on this theme of the education of women. She was so renowned that people called her the star of Utrecht, the Dutch Minerva, that's the goddess of wisdom. Um, and all, all of these uh, studies that she, um, that she versed in herself in uh, included speaking many languages. She studied a lot of languages and could write and correspond with a lot of scholars of the time uh, in these languages too. She was, she's most, uh, mostly remembered for being the first woman to study at the university and advocate uh, really for the access um, uh, of women to education. If you want to learn more uh, about uh, Anna Maria von Schurman, you can find a lot of information on annamariavonschurman.org. Uh, and you can find also more information in our uh, bibliography uh, that we're going to post in the comments here and also on the first page of our website. So being, uh, beside being a very learned woman of femme de lettres, Schurman was also a theologian and, and she studied deeply the scripture and she was a devout woman, a devout Christian. Labadie and Schurman really got on well on this, on this topic as you can imagine and they, they became close friends and both of them were really attracted by the reformation and the, the idea of restoring the, restoring the church. So they both championed this renewal of the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, and it 
clashed a lot with uh, the established church of the time and, um, and the, the, the institutions of the Dutch Reformed Church. This um, led to a split that happened in 1669. That's the date that we usually understand to be the founding of the Labadist movement. Labadies, Germans, and all their friends' desire for a spiritual and moral regeneration of the Reformed Church kind of hit a wall when Labadie was dismissed from his pastoral charge uh, in the Reformed Church. And as a consequence, in 16. 69, the members of the community moved uh, to Amsterdam and they were soon called Labadists. Uh, they prayed, they shared, they lived in, in some buildings uh, on Lorechat in uh, the Jordan neighborhood in Amsterdam and they had all their uh, uh, gift, their, their goods in common. They uh, lived in this form on the model of the early church. They used different terms to refer to themselves. They wouldn't call themselves Labadists, which was more kind of an insult, but they, they talked about themselves as l'œuvre de Dieu, the work of God, Opus Dei, uh, the Church of the Lord, and the French Flemish Church, or the Reformed Church secluded from the Word. You see, all these terms are really giving you an idea of what they thought they were doing and what they thought they were. That is, they were not so much uh, falling into some uh, denominational understanding of what, what was the church, but they were challenging it uh, by really trying to go back to a form of unity of the church to beyond uh, denominational or even cultural uh, boundaries. This was also um, linked to a deep core of a form of monasticism and monastic life, as you can see in the Reformed Church secluded from the world. So all of this, uh, you can see it in the community which really developed uh, starting at, at this moment. Um, they published a lot of books starting in Amsterdam. Uh, here you can see a picture of the Petit Catechisme ou Commencement d'Instruction pour les petits enfants qui commencent à parler et à entendre quelque chose. That's already the third edition in 1683. Um, that's a very interesting book because it's bilingual catechism. So you're on one side you have French, on the other one you have Dutch. And that's something we're going to see um, in which very much part of the culture and identity of the Labadist movement is that it is a bilingual movement. After many persecutions, the Labadists uh, and wanderings in Germany, uh, in Denmark, after the death of their founder, in uh, 1673, uh, uh, the Labadists settled in, in a little village, uh, which is called Vuvert in Friesland, in the north of the Netherlands. I can show you a map here. So here you see, um, oh, little pointer, pointer. Here you see, um, Labadi was born here, he, Geneva is here, uh, that's the south of the Netherlands here and Amsterdam is here. So they were here for a couple of, time, uh, of, of months, mostly. Then they went to Germany, to Denmark, and they landed in Vuvert in Friesland, which was kind of a secluded part of the Netherlands of the time, quite away from uh, the, the urban hub of Amsterdam, uh, then Aar, La Haye. Um, so it's already kind of a, a very uh, monastic spot that they chose uh, here in Vuvert, in Friesland. So I can go back to this slide. Uh, so the community, when it was in Vuvert, here you can see a picture, a view of Walter Castle, where they settled, which belonged to some of the prominent members of the community. Um, so when they settled there, the community really started to thrive and become sustainable. Uh, they had mixed farming, some form of industry, bookbinding, uh, and all, they also practiced uh, medicine and, and really sold a lot of their um, concoctions and, and uh, drugs. The community, it's really difficult to estimate the number of the community at that stage, but some people said that they reached uh, 600 members just in the little village of uh, Vuvert, but they had followers uh, in all major cities in the Netherlands, in Germany, and as we will see, in the New World too. 
so here you can see also a picture of um, a mummy, well, a dried body, that you can still see today. There are a couple of them in the crypt of the Church of Uvert, and some of them are Labadists, uh, most surely, uh, but they've never been studied really in depth, and that would be a very interesting uh, thing to do, I think, for uh, specialists of uh, early modern um, life and, and, and religious communities. So the Labadists went, as I told you, overseas. They not only stayed in, um, in this part um, of the Netherlands, um, but the Netherlands was really internationally connected through uh, trade and colonial uh, enterprises. And the Labadists settled in two uh, different uh, places in America, in the Americas, in the New Netherland, uh, that is New York and the adjacent uh, colony of Maryland, and also in Suriname in South America. I'm not going to talk much about Suriname, uh, although it's a very interesting uh, settlement also of the Labadists. But I'm going to, we're going to talk more about, of course, the Labadists in New York and Maryland. The community in Friesland, in Vuvert, became overpopulated, so they also f were looking for other places uh, to settle and to uh, also spread um, their experience, spiritual experiences and way of life. Um, so here you can see on this picture a view of the port of New York. Uh, I think it's actually inspired was by a Labadist drawing uh, that we will see uh, soon. And uh, here you also have a picture um, taken by Pita uh, of the three, uh, 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 two, uh, two uh, letters uh, from Suriname sent to uh, the Netherlands, the community, uh, where they talk about uh, the life of the community in Suriname. So we know a lot about the experience of uh, the Labadists' experience uh, in North America because of one of the oldest accounts of life in New York, um, which was written by a Labadist. Uh, so it gives you a, a really like a little vignette of, well, it's quite a long vignette, but kind of a, a big tableau of uh, the life in, in, uh, in New York at the time. And it was written by Jasper Dankartz. Jasper Dankartz was a elder of the Labadist community, and he was sent uh, to uh, New Amsterdam, uh, New Netherlands, it was already New York at the time, but to the, this region that he calls New Netherlands, as you can see um, here on uh, the first page of his journal, that's, um, that's in the custody of the Brooklyn Historical Society, and that was rediscovered in the 19th century. So you see um, here the first page, and in this journal that he wrote to actually send back to the mother uh, community in Friesland, he really describes, uh, describes in detail uh, the life of the colony and the people he meets. He really likes to give um, truer than life uh, portraits of uh, members of the uh, colonists that he, he meets. And that's a very touching uh, portrayal of the community and a lot of uh, members of the Huguenot society or people may recognize actually their ancestors uh, in some of these uh, stories that Dankertz uh, tells us. So Dankertz has a very critical outlook uh, of the community uh, that he visits, uh, the communities that he visits in uh, the New World and in, in, in New New York. Uh, here I put you a little uh, excerpt from uh, his journal that gives you an idea of, uh, of his style and how he's writing. It's quite a fun read, uh, to be honest. Uh, he's, he's, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to, uh, to visit New York through his eyes in uh, 1679. He has a very critical look, as I said, uh, on the colonial society because as a Labadist, he also sees it, uh, he sees all the worldliness in it, uh, the greed, um, the behavior of the colonists that he uh, usually uh, deems as quite unchristian. Um, and so this little excerpt gives you an idea, and I'm going to read passages of it, maybe not all of it. That's um, the one day after he landed in New York. Uh, and so he arrives there, and there's the fort that you can see here, and the church 
that was at the moment the main church, and I think the only church at the moment uh, in New York City. Uh, that's a modern uh, this depiction of it, but that gives you an idea. He describes it actually in his journal. So the church being in the fort, we had the opportunity to look through the latter as we had come too early for preaching. Uh, so he describes the church and he also describes uh, the preacher who is there that day, um, who was the Dutch uh, minister. He was a thick, corpulent person with a red and bloated face and a very slabbering speech. His text was, and then he goes on describing the sermon. And just after the sermon, it's quite of a fun moment. So he's lodging as we're at two people and, uh, at a family. And well, the family he finds a bit unchristian and ungodly. Um, just after the sermon, they actually invite him to go uh, have a drink. So um, would be able, So he, they're invited to a place where they would be able to taste the beer of New Netherlands in as much as it was a brewery. And he's not really pleased by the company there that he finds quite uh, unchristian, as, he, as he, he, he describes, on account of this, of its being to uh, some extent a pleasant spot, it was resorted to on Sundays by all sorts of revelers and was a low pot house. Our company immediately found acquaintances there and joined them, of course. And they were ungodly, so the ungodly joined with the ungodly. Um, but it being repugnant to our feeling to be there, we walked into the orchard to seek pleasure in contemplating the innocent objects of nature. Among others, other trees, we observed a mulberry tree, the leaves of which were as large as a plate. The wife showed us pears larger than the fist, picked from a three-year's graft which had borne 40 of them. So this is a very uh, poignant description that it really gives you an idea of how he looks at uh, New York society um, of the time. So he doesn't really fit. Um, he's kind of an observer of all this society, and I think that's what, really what is interesting about it. That it doesn't he doesn't come here to do business. He doesn't come. He, he comes here to look for a spot to settle a community, but he has kind of a noblesse oblige look at uh, the community uh, in New York City. Some of his critiques of uh, New York society of the time um, has to do about the abuse uh, of the colonists and their greed. Uh, the way they exert slavery um, and in plantations for uh, cropping tobacco, which are two things that the Labadists at that time uh, deemed totally ungodly, uh, slavery and tobacco. And they also, he's also shocked by the way uh, a lot of the colonists treat uh, Native American people by giving them alcohol uh, and um, behaving with them in a very uh, inappropriate way. He really notices the lack of devotion in what he calls true faith amongst the colonists. And so it also, in a sense, gives, uh, like, strengthen his call and the call of the Labadists, I think, to come to America uh, to find uh, and create a, a pure new Jerusalem uh, in the wilderness somewhere. Um, so most, what's really interesting, I think, in his journal is that the most important character is a Mohawk Dutch uh, Christian woman whose name is Aleta. She has really like the most uh, the length the, the the most detailed portrait uh, of any person in uh, the journal is a portrait of Aleta, and she is uh, he records is is what she uh, she tells him, and that's a very very touching uh, description. Uh, she, it's a couple of pages in the journal, uh, and here there's the the entry in the journal about it. So I asked her to Aleta to relate to me herself how it had gone with her from the first of her coming to Christendom, both outwardly and inwardly, you see. Looking at me, she said, how glad I am I that I am so fortunate that God should permit me to behold such Christians whom I have so long desired to see and to whom I may speak from the bottom of my heart without fear and that there are such Christians in the world. How often have I asked myself, are there no other Christians than those amongst whom we live? Which is quite a Labadist question too. 
who are so godless and lead worse lives than the Indians and yet have such a pure and holy religion? Now I see God thinks of us, and I sent you from the other end of the world to speak to us. I was surprised to find, so that's Dankart who speaks again, I was surprised to find so far in the woods and amongst Christians, but why should I, why, but why amongst Christians, among, among Indians, among Christians, ten times worse than Indians, a person who should address me with such affection and love of God? But I answered and comforted her. Then he concludes, and that's a very powerful conclusion, when Yes, she expressed to me more reality of the truth of Christianity than anyone, whether minister or other person, in all New Netherlands. So it's quite a powerful statement from Dunkartz uh, here. And here you can see a, a picture taken from uh, his journal. He tried to do some sketches. Uh, he even says that he's, he's a bit disappointed that he didn't uh, learn to sketch before he came over to America because... Well, he could maybe have improved a bit of his style. Um, but here you see a, port a couple of fish and a Native American woman that he portrayed. That's the only portrait of a person that he actually uh, drew in, a, in, uh, in his journal. Um, so that's quite, it's quite a touching uh, uh, passage, this one. If you're interested in learning more about uh, the journal of Jasper Dankartz, you can easily find an English translation online it's really a fun read, I think. Uh, some passages are a bit lengthy, but you can skip them. And uh, one of my favorite passages, to be honest, is when he visits Harvard College, and uh, where he finds actually the students smoking in the dorms, so he's wondering <laughs> if it's actually a tavern or a school. And he really also pities uh, um, the empty printing office and the quality of their press, the press of Harvard University, or well, Harvard College of the time, uh, which is actually more meager um, than the Labadists uh, press in Friesland, the one from which all the Labadist books were printed. Um, so things uh, change over time, um, as you can see in America. Now, um, Dan Katz and his friends, uh, his friend, uh, that's um, uh, Slater, uh, who, with whom he was visiting and looking for a place, uh, to settle, found a tract of land to settle, and it is now in Cecil County in Maryland. So it, this place became called uh, the Labadee Tract, uh, and the estate was also called New Bohemia or and Bohemia Manor. So the Labadees settled in uh, New Bohemia in Maryland around 1684, that is two or three years after the arrival of the first Labadists. Um, uh, colonists in New York, so that for a couple of years uh, the Labadists were uh, only in, in New York gathering together uh, in some form of house meetings and, and praying uh, alongside each other. So uh, they came from, most of the Labadists came directly from the mother community in the Netherlands uh, to settle this new plantation that they, they, they bought. Uh, so the Lapidus movement had followers in New York, as I mentioned. Uh, some of the historic families of New York are closely associated with the Lapidists. Uh, amongst others, there is Peter Bayard, uh, who was one of the earliest Lapidists in, in, in the New World. Uh, he was actually the nephew of the governor, uh, the governor uh, Stuyvesant. So you see it's also quite an upper elite uh, group. Uh, that's joining the, the Labadist uh, movement, just like in the Netherlands. Um, some other people uh, joined the, the movement um, or had uh, house meetings like in New York and uh, actually uh, Peter Bayard and his wife, Blandine uh, Kirstede, they had this form of house uh, meetings in New York City. On the Labadist tract that you can see here on the map, so you see Baltimore uh, on one side, and uh, amongst the little hearts here, I couldn't find another way to mark the, the tract, uh, is the, the, the tract of land that was called the Labadee Tract. So just uh, on the, the entrance and close to the canal uh, of the Delaware. So they developed a community there which was really on the model of Uvert, which to a certain sense became problematic because it's another world and another reality. 
Uh, and they lacked uh, a lot of workforce uh, when they came, um, because not a lot of actually reform uh, and Huguenots uh, from the first generation immigrants joined the community. A lot of the people who joined who were Huguenots and already in America were already second generation. You can imagine that if you're coming from um, a foreign country, you don't really want to go into a new religious movement. You want to try to stick uh, with people whom uh, you know, maybe from where you come from, that is in France, or um, people um, who really belong to the same faith as you knew in the old world. So they actually attracted second generation Huguenots in America and people who were already part of the movement in the Netherlands who came over as a community uh, to settle this tract of land. The community um, went into quite a lot of trouble um, because of the abusive leadership of Peter St uh, Sleuter and his wife. Um, and a lot of the ideals of the Labadists um, that were still at play in, in the Netherlands were also uh, revised uh, to meet with the reality of, of the new world and the, they became also um, incultured uh, to a certain extent to the, the, the colonial uh, life of the communities uh, around them. And they introduced um, African slave labor in the early uh, 1690s, something that Dankarts disapproved of, but you see, uh, it changed. Uh, and also the cropping of tobacco, another thing that was actually uh, not allowed for the Labadists uh, at the time. So you see, you had to adapt to other realities. Um, and uh, the land was uh, owned in common, just like in Vuvert, until 1698. And this uh, tract of land um, is still uh, um, the ancestral home of the Bayard, Bouchel, and Sloter families. Here you can see a picture of the great house that's still standing, um, that's uh, on the tract of land. And some of the streets and roads around uh, in, on the tract bear the name of, of Labadee, like Labadee Mill Lane here. Uh, so you can visit, uh, it's a fun, uh, it's a nice, cute, uh, rural part of uh, Maryland. So there's, the Labadees stayed uh, in this place uh, for about 15 years, you see, before they actually uh, started to disband or, um, or just live as more individual uh, settlers. Now, when the Labadists, Dankerts, and the succeeding uh, Labadists uh, came to America, they brought with them their religious culture and practices, which was really kind of the core identity of the Labadist movement, which was quite different from the Reformed uh, Church. Um, so they organized conventicles in New York City, and they shared their religious literature in French and in Dutch with those uh, who were interested. So they wrote in his journal, Dankerts talks about and tells us about how he translated some of the books and poems from French into Dutch when he is actually traveling uh, because he only has a French copy, so he has to translate for some people who are only able to speak uh, Dutch. And he hands out also a lot of books uh, from Labadee, and he actually comes across people who already have books uh, of Labadee uh, in New York even before they came. So you see that... Um, quite present in this uh, part of uh, the colonies. So in the Netherlands, the Labadists had written and collected many hymns in French um, in various hymnals. Here you can see um, um, three of them. Uh, I'm going to explain them in a bit more in detail. So when Dunkerts visited America for the first time in 1679, the first hymn was just the first hymnal was just published, Cantique Sacré et Spirituel. Um, it says second edition, but actually it's most it's a first edition because um, uh, it's so uh, it's a really re uh, recreated hymnal. Uh, so it was published in 1678, and this hymnal um, uh, comprehends some um, cant cantique canticles that were written by Labadi himself, but a lot of cantique of, of hymns are actually uh, written by members of the community. So we don't know their identity, uh, but there was an important production of hymns inside the community. The second uh, recueil that you see here, Recueil de Cantique Spirituel, uh, pour l'usage familier de l'Église du Seigneur, retiré du monde, et recueilli à présent à Vieux Vert en Frise, 
it was published um, actually where, when Dan Cox came back, uh, basically from his travel in 1680. And the last one that you can see here is a combination of um, the first two that you see, and that was published in Dutch in 1683. Uh, and so the title says Eilige Gesangen, um, Holy Hymns, uh, Uit et Frans Vertalt, uh, translated mm -hmm. from the French. And you also have a poem attached to it at the end by Anna Maria von Thurman about the coming of the kingdom of God, of Christ. Um, so you see that the, the whole corpus of the whole uh, collection of Labadist hymns was really bilingual. And um, that's what we're going to, that's what we sung today in our service uh, in both languages. And that's what really uh, um, gathered together uh, people in the Labadist communities who spoke uh, both languages, and not all of them spoke both, uh, but they could uh, at least uh, sing in their uh, preferred language. Um, so this hymn, or the last one, Eilige Gesangen, is really the one we're going to talk about because it's translation um, of the French hymns, that is, all the hymns that we have in Eilige Gesangen, we also have French equivalent of them, the French original. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, hymn, the on only remaining copies exist in the Netherlands and in Europe. So it's a hymnal that was used in America, but um, as far as I know, the, no copy still exists here. And that's probably why also it, it was, uh, um, nobody thought of it in America really as a part of uh, American hymnody uh, in the colonial period. So, as I mentioned, the Labadist community was at least bilingual uh, in its worship or practice, just like the Netherlands and New York of the time were at least bilingual, because you had people, uh, of course, Dutch settlers, you had uh, uh, Huguenots who would speak French, and all, a lot of uh, English speakers too, Swedish, um, Germans. So the, the reality of New York has always been a melting pot. Uh, or a, at least a, a place where a lot of different languages and culture uh, live together. And the Labadist hymnal is really representative of that because of its um, bilingual uh, nature. It's a bit like really today when in New York you see like the only presence of Spanish and English in the streets and everywhere. Uh, some members of the community, as I mentioned, were also English speakers like John Moll that we're going to talk about uh, later. Um, and Labadie, their founder, was only a French speaker, and he wrote a great number of hymns only in French, so all the hymns were translated. Uh, it's quite touching here at Saint-Esprit because we're always uh, uh, dealing with translation as being a French-speaking uh, Episcopal church, and we have always to uh, switch between languages and always move between these uh, different words and gifts and tongues. Um, so the members of the community sang actually their hymns. We have, uh, we know about that. Uh, they sang them sometimes both in French and in Dutch, and it's totally possible to sing hymns at the same time uh, in two different languages. Um, and they you really use them in their house meetings and also during their daily chores. Some hymns are actually composed especially for some uh, chores. So they translated them in both languages, and. Um, and that's, that's one of, um, of the reason why uh, also um, the Labadis hymnal is really unique and the, the corpus of Labadis hymns is unique because it's an uh, early modern witness of, uh, of really a bilingual community uh, with the uh, same common corpus. Um, so the Eilige Gesangen that we are going to talk more in detail uh, about uh, was published in 1683, as I mentioned, and it's uh, a really precious witness of an early transatlantic to uh, piety. Um, and some of the c copies include this register that Aya is going to uh, to uh, explain to us. Uh, this register is basically a, a a little booklet at the end of the hymnal. Um, that's giving us some tunes that are not common. That is, some of the hymns were sung on the Geneva and Psalter, the tunes of the Geneva and Psalters, uh, but these are not um, these the Geneva and Psalter tunes, so they give us the tunes so that we can know how to sing them. 
So all the, the, the hymns that are in this register, in this, uh, register, we have the French and the Dutch. Now I'm going to walk you through um, this, um, some of these hymns and try to see if we can actually call them um, the sweet singers of Israel. And if I use this expression into um, uh, quotation marks, it's because um, the Labadists um, were, I mean, in the, in, the, in the papers of William Penn, who visited the Labadist community a couple of times in Europe and in America, there is this very strange list that seems to hint at a specific city of and quality of Labadist congregational singing. So I mentioned John Moore, uh, who was an English-speaking um, member of the community, and he was uh, also one of the patrons of the Labadist movement in Maryland. Um, and in 1682, he was, as the papers of uh, William Penn says, living peacefully and religiously uh, in Bohemia Manor, and he's called on a list uh, by Penn, a sweet singer of Israel. So on this list, what's really strange is that this list only lists people um, in, with generic terms, that is, they are, he lists uh, denominations, nationalities, uh, so he says like a Quaker, a German, and he says a sweet, sweet singer of Israel. And that's to qualify uh, John uh, Moll, who was a, a Labadist. So that's a very uh, enigmatic um, mention, but we may understand it when we look closely at the Labadist hymns. Mm -hmm. um, so let's have a look uh, at some of the hymns uh, we sang today, because they reveal this uh, specific uh, piety uh, of the Labadist, its diversity, and its themes, and Aya will walk us through uh, the music and really show us also how uh, it's showing some form of diversity. Um, so our congregational hymn today was Abime de Bonté, Afron von Rudigheit in Dutch. Um, this hymn uh, is quite meditative. It talks about the mysterious bounties of God that invites those who contemplate them to surrender to his love. So that's a very mystical theme, if you want, in a hymn. Uh, you also see in this hymn how the, the, this spiritual themes backs up the, 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 the communal life of the, of the Labadist uh, movement, which was based on the sharing of goods. And in this uh, stanza, you can really see it. Soisons uh, uh, of our hearts, so be uh, you alone, um, the Lord and master of our hearts, um, of that which so lawfully belongs to you. And in offering all our goods and you, our being with glad hearts, receive our all from this time forth. And so Nigel did a, a lovely translation for us of this stanza from uh, Abime de Bonté. And uh, so in this stanza, uh, you can really see the, the theme of Labadis piety that's uh, a form of merge of mystical abandonment to God and abandonment in the life of the community. Our second hymn that uh, was actually uh, Cynthia's solo that you can listen to if you've not in uh, the recording of her service um, is more of a spiritual song. It's really uh, kind of, uh, yeah, a spiritual song. It's very, it's very short lines. Uh, it's quite light and springy. Um, in this hymn, the contemplation of nature, the one we just saw uh, in Dunkart's journal, you see, that's this idea of a pristine uh, nature. Uh, really leads uh, the faithful to the contemplation uh, of God through singing. So the singing of the birds joins and echoes the singing of the angels and resonates with the reality of the human singer and the community who is singing at the moment uh, that hymn or Cynthia for us today. Uh, so it really invites the faithful to find a place in creation between the birds and the angels. Um, that's really what we saw in, in Denkers, as I mentioned. And, and the song of the birds leads the faithful to contemplate the body of Jesus, and you can see it in, throughout the different stanzas, um, the spouse uh, of the Christian soul, soul um, whose song is even more beautiful than the song of the birds, and also the human uh, songs that we are uh, singing uh, congregationally. 
So finally, contrary to angels and birds, and that's what you can see in this uh, specific, uh, this precise stanza, um, humans, whoever they are, can kneel down in prayer. Birds can do it, angels can do it, but humans can. And that's what this is saying. Come all folk, come all ages, fall on your knees to give him homage. It is your privilege. Why would you tarry? Come without qualm. May nothing hold you back from such a sweet Lord. That's a very lovely hymn. And in this stanza, you can see really also the, the missionary aspect of the Labadist faith that's um, inviting uh, everybody and uh, people um, of all ages and, 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 and cultures uh, into uh, the, the community. Al alongside this, um, this hymn, I've started to put some pictures of uh, um, that were actually drawn by a Labadist, and this one is really, I'm going to talk more about her, Maria Sibylia Merian, uh, but you can see how they resonate together. Now our um, hymn that we're going, to, uh, there's another hymn that we'd like to share with you that was not in our service um, recording. It's Jésus est tout. Um, Jesus ist all. Jesus is all. So I'm going to play it for you and then I'm going to comment it uh, shortly. Jesus ist all and we have left and it's in her temple and head. Jesus is all and we have left and it's in her temple and head. He comes with him to freedom. Die is um her temple and king. So as you could hear, once again, it's a very contemplative hymn that calls for uh, a holistic life transformation. You could find also the, the lyrics of this hymn in the bulletin. Um, Jesus is compared to the tree of life whose sweet fruit gives eternal life. So in the stanza, I have a single out here, the poet plays with the polysemy of the word virtue, which in French and in English, in quite an old-fashioned way of talking about it, means both moral virtues and the special properties, for instance, of a plant. Um, so you could see, you can say, for instance, uh, the virtue of tea is to be an antioxidant. And here you see that um, the poet is playing with this polysemy of the word virtue. Uh, since love garners in its bosom all virtues, the fruit, the tree, and leaf. So different parts uh, of the same plant may have different virtues, also a bit like the different gifts in the church. And Jesus is described here uh, in a very medicinal way, um, that is the panacea. Jesus is the universal remedy that combines the properties of the fruit, the tree, 
and the leaf. So the different biological parts of the plant, if you want, and the different virtues of them are gathered together in the community, in their singing, and in the reality of, of, of Christ and his body, uh, which is um, in, in which the, the, the church is uh, restored. So there's much more to say about the Labadists, um, and I'm going to just uh, conclude uh, with uh, Maria Sibylla Merian, because uh, she's a really f another fascinating Labadist woman, um, and a lot of her work uh, as a naturalist artist um, is, has been heavily influenced uh, by Labadist piety and Labadist hymnody. Um, there is actually um, um, some um, people have, have said that she joined the community uh, after having read some of the hymns by Labadie. And you can totally see that at play on some of her plates like this one, where she has a form of really keen attention to the natural world um, and its organization, the way things are related to. Uh, and that's quite of a, a pioneering uh, view that she introduced in natural science uh, to relate um, the plant and the insect, mm -hmm. to see them in relation, to understand what people are saying about the plant, uh, that is when she um, she studies plants. She also talks about the properties and all of of this um, by also really looking at um, at them together and trying to assemble them in her plates. So she was a, natu a naturalist artist. That is someone who draws uh, and for at that time scientific, artistic, religious reasons um, plants and and insects. Um, she she was a member. I mean, she was uh, coming from a very prominent family of German artists, and she joined uh, the Labadist community in Friesland in 1683. Um, she she has been said and has actually studied quite recently that she has pioneered the modern understanding of ecology uh, because she introduced a direct study of insects uh, to draw plates. That is, before people sometimes would draw insects by not actually studying them or like looking carefully at them, just like Dankarts look carefully uh, at uh, the, his environment in uh, the New World. And she actually also went to America, not to um, North America, but to South America, where the Labadist had connections, that is in Suriname. And after a uh, field research in Suriname, uh, she published a very famous uh, book, which is the Metamorphosis Insectorum uh, Surinamensium, uh, the Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname. And uh, the plates um, come uh, from, this, um, from this book. It's a beautiful book that really tries to describe uh, what's the fauna and flora of Suriname a bit like Dankart's did, and to a certain extent, uh, spiritually, how uh, the poems of Labadie also do. So that's all uh, that I have, really, uh, for us um, on, 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 um, on Merian. But I'd just like to conclude um, with this, um, that for the Labadie's hymnody uh, was a way to express this spirituality, and you can see it uh, not only in hymns, but also in the plates of Merian. Um, it was kind of a creative synthesis of a Catholic uh, and Reformed uh, influence. Uh, it's quite beyond the, the boundaries uh, of established and national uh, churches as they tried to uh, form uh, this new uh, community that was uh, gathering the elect uh, for the coming of Christ. So we don't know the identity of many of the authors of the, the Labadist hymns that we have in Eilire Zangen and the original French uh, hymns. Um, but we can, um, we can identify that they are from very diff they are, they have diff showing different genres, different styles. Um, they have also different approaches to poetry and, and hymnody. Some are more theological, some are more didactic. Some uh, are pure, um, more uh, contemplative, some are quite merry and joyful. Um, we know also from other accounts that the authors were both men and women. Uh, Schurman was herself a poet, and uh, poems are included in Eilire um, Zange. And some of the hymns, like this one, the Chanson de la Lessive, were also associated 
with uh, very precise uh, tasks. Um, so they were, the hymns were really accompanying uh, the life of the community. Some of the transatlantic journeys to Suriname um, gave um, birth to some hymns. Uh, Thanksgiving, the de fame, like death of uh, uh, leaders in the community, uh, or a plague, uh, or menial tasks like this. So the hymns were a way to gather the community, uh, different generations, different voices, uh, in both languages and also on both continents, because the Labadist hymnals was used on both sides of the Atlantic and North and South America when they uh, settled uh, their communities there. Um, so the, the Labadist hymnals were also a way of really, t really like binding it, and you can s binding the community, and you can see it with this lovely um, uh, book um, that's um, actually the Eilige Gesang, and you see the different pages that are almost falling uh, apart. Uh, but it gave an idea of, of what the Labadist community was and how they also disbanded uh, at the end um, because of the passing of time and the change in their uh, yearning and expectations. Um, so the community really disbanded between the 1690s and 1720s. Um, these hymns, as a matter of fact, fell out of use when the community disappeared, uh, although some of them existed in translation in German. Uh, so it is quite thrilling at Saint-Esprit to be able to, uh, to revive and sing together these hymns again uh, in a place uh, where, they, where they were uh, once sung, some 300 years ago. So I'm now going to let Aya introduce her, us to the music uh, more in details of the Labadist and see uh, how this is um, telling us more about them too. Thank you, Aya, and thank you all of you. Thank you, Jolice. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about their music and also uh, how I prepare the score for us to sing and perform. So we had the pleasure of introducing some of the Lavadist hymns to you this morning. And we picked four hymns for this occasion. And I hope you all had a chance to enjoy singing and listening. So here uh, I will talk about, first, we will look at about the early music printing and how the sheet music was printed that time. Secondly, I will show you how I transcribe the music to a more accessible format so that we can sing and perform comfortably. And at last, my overall musical remarks and observations about their hymns. So this is how it started. Last year, Joris showed me a facsimile of a 17th century music manuscript. And he explained to me that it was a collection of the hymns used in the Lavadist community. And they look like this. The music is written in one of the historical notations, and it was printed by using the movable type. So it looks a bit different from the sheet music in our time. At the beginning of the hymn collection, it says that, let it start the whole hymn gesangen, now the order for the alphabet by the Zalman Davids of Welke and Geboden Gesongen. Register of the preceding songs on the order of the alphabet were in the Psalms of David to which some are sung. So the hymns are listed in alphabetical order of the text in the collection. Before we look at those hymns closely, I would like to show you about the music printing process that time. Movable type printing is a process of printing music developed in the 16th century. 
and they feature the system using movable pieces of type. Music notation is usually more complicated than text. You need stuff lines, notes, rests, dots, in addition to words for text. So setting up a page of music type involved assembling lots of little blocks. Here in this picture, you see one of the music types used that time. It is a Gohon music set, which was used to print choir books in the 16th and the 17th centuries in Antwerp, which are now preserved in the Plantem Lattice Museum there in Antwerp. To explain how they did it, I will show you a brief video which was filmed at the Plantem Lattice Museum. The video is about 10 minutes long and you can watch the complete clip on YouTube, but I edited for a shorter version, so here it is. Here at the Plantin Moretus Museum in Antwerp, we have some preserved examples of 16th century music type, and we can see how the printed music was literally put together. For each note, you would need a separate piece of type. Here's one with the note head on the middle line of the stave. If you wanted to build an ascending scale, you would go from there to one with a piece of type on the next space and then on the next line up and the next space and on the top line. You could save the number of pieces of type by turning it the other way up and so now we have the ascending scale of all the notes from the bottom line up to the middle line. So this is how they printed music. As you also see in this picture, individual blocks of musical notes and alphabets were lined up in a row and they locked together, placed in a printing press, inked, and at last placed onto paper. Next, I would like to talk about very briefly how you read the historical notation used here and how you transcribe it to the modern notation. This is the original manuscript of the Sanctus, which we sang this morning. And as I said earlier, the music looks a bit different from the notation we are familiar with. In the original manuscript, the C clef is used instead of G clef, treble clef. It means middle C is located at the middle line of the clef. 
So in this case, the first note is G, Sol. And also, the names of notes are different. They are called longa, blavi, semi-blavi, minim, semi-minim, and fusa. And the rest signs look like a scribble, but each of them corresponds to the duration of the notes. So we see three rests in this music. And these are rest for a semi-minimum. There are also other signs which are not used any longer in the modern notation, such as custos and sinum congruentiae. So you need to consider those aspects when you look at the historical notation. And I will show you a transcription I made, which is a version in modern notation. This is one of the transcriptions I made. This is a song called Dunhill Loft to Hear, and Joe Plays is a Load, that Cynthia sang beautifully this morning, and Joyce explained the poem earlier in the presentation. So what I did to create a transcription is that, first, I used a modern score layout, used modernized choice of clef and notation, and added bar lines where necessary. That means all the notes of the melody are set on the G clef, treble clef and the series of eighth notes are beamed together. Like these are eighth notes are beamed in the modern notation so that it looks easier to read. Only one Dutch verse is written in the original manuscript. So I added under the notes, French text, which there is found in the separate printed hymnals uh, that he also explained in the earlier slides. And we still don't know yet about the original performance practice in the Labadis community, like how they were performed or sung in the community that time. So for today's occasion, I created a bass line and some accompaniment as you heard this morning. In this music, I just wrote down the bass line and by following one of the performance practices of the 17th century called Basso Continuo, I improvise and play the accompaniment part based on those bass lines. So this is how I made a performing edition from the original manuscript so that we can actually perform by using this score. So let's listen how it sounds. Next, I would like to take a closer look at this hymn and see if there are any characteristics about this hymn. This applies to actually all the Labadist hymns in the collection, but let's start with a style of the hymn. The texture is monophonic. It has a single and accompanied melodic line. And it is also strophic, that means all verses are sung to the same music. 
and syllabic, which is one syllable is set to each note. When one syllable is assigned to two or more notes, the notes are joined by slurs, like here and here and here. And that means one syllable is elongated for two or more notes. I also like to point out that in this hymn, there is a beautifully executed technique called word painting. Word painting is a musical depiction of words in text. So one melodic gesture actually reflects, illustrate, or imply the meaning of the words. For example, fuchst, midden, beneden, that is highest, middle, and under. And if you look at the music, for the word highest is here, they are in the high range, and the figure is actually going up. It's da da na na na, it's going up. And for the middle, for the word midden, they are right in the middle range in the song. And for the down is here, the note is actually going down as na da da da. And longer notes are generally assigned to show strong words and syllables. In this case, here, load, and ear, that's honor, and here is here, and ear is here. And they are set on the long note. Another example is Angel for Hell. Joyce mentioned them earlier also, that it's angel, angel and bird and they reflect mirrored images in the music. They move with the same interval, perfect force, ascending on the word angel and descending on the word bird. And I think they illustrate their images beautifully. Also, there are words like lift, love, Zut, sweet, melody, and zingen, that sing, and each of them shows melodious gestures in the music, like here, as a very melodious motif in the music. So I will play the music again, and I hope you will enjoy some details of the music. So, how about the other hymns in the collection? There are 48 hymns in this collection, and I have started to make a catalog and written down contents and forms of each hymn and any characteristics and compositional remarks. We still don't know yet if some of them are their original compositions that means any members of the Labadist community actually composed. So far, I had a success in identifying a hymn tune for only three of them, which are two very well-known hymn tunes, Hondé Adieu, 
uh, which is actually the last hymn we sang this morning, and in Duchi Jubilo. And also, I found a matching tune in the collection of old and new Dutch peasant songs and country dances, which was published in Amsterdam at the beginning of the 18th century. And actually, it contains 996 songs, and I checked them all, and I found one matching tune. The compositional style and character of those hymns show a great deal of variety. They are composed in numbers of different keys, both major and minor keys, and some are composed in an old church mode, such as Dorian, Phlegian, Lydian, which is a system of pitch organization used in a Gregorian chant. They are, they are in a different meter, duple or triple meters. Some of them are long, some are short. Some of them are more in the straightforward form, and in the clear structure with four bell phrases, and with simple moving rhythm. On the other hand, some have quite a few quick rhythmical figures and an an unexpected progressions. And I want to show you two hymns to compare some contrasting elements. The first one is this. It is one of the longest hymns and consists of 67 measures long of notation. Let's listen first how it sounds. And continues a bit further, but I stop at the halfway now. As you might already notice, the notation looks very white. That means they are used only long note values, such as semi brevi and minim, that is modern equivalent of whole notes and half notes. And it is in the style of ancient plain chant. It means the melody goes with a free flowing pulse with no actual regular metric accent. And it moves smoothly and mostly with stepwise motion. On the other hand, the second one sounds very different from the first one. So let's listen. There are only eight measures, and with two sections of music, with each section repeated. Also in here, only short note values, fusa and semi fusa, eighth and sixteenth notes in modern notation are used, and the range of the melody is relatively very high, going up to even high G in here. And also, the remarkable thing is that, that the use of rhythmic movement, such as dotted rhythm, syncopations, 
as well as several leaps in the melody. As you see in this, there's a leap of fifth, and this is leaping down. And also chromatic progressions. That means the melody moves chromatically from like C sharp to C natural. All of the features are not C in the first hymn. And just looking, these two hymns explain how diverse and varied those Lavadist hymns are. So, these were what I remarked in observing the original manuscript of the Lavadist hymns. And we love to know what you think of the music and then how you like the hymns we sang this morning. If you have any questions, we would love to, we'd be delighted to answer them too. So we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. And if you watch this live, please join us for the Zoom discussion starting right after this. You will find the Zoom link in the bulletin on the first page of our website. Thank you very much for joining us. Merci à Joris. Merci beaucoup Aya. Thank you well. Et merci à tous. Merci à tous. <laughs>